you need to you, companies need to have this compliance program or have visibility into their data almost at their fingertips. So those are the things that get me excited and rather fired up. That was Vince Walden, CEO of Kona AI. This is Tom Fox. Welcome to the award-winning data-driven compliance. In this podcast, we will discuss how to use data to improve and enhance the effectiveness of your compliance program, creating greater business efficiency, all leading to more return on investment for your compliance program. Join host Tom Fox as he explores how data will drive your compliance program to the next level. This podcast is sponsored by Kona AI, and now a word about Kona AI. Kona AI is the leading AI-driven solution for anti-corruption, risk, and compliance professionals. Our easy-to-use software and flexible, secure deployment models drive fact-based decisions that focus on the risk areas that matter to the regulators and your business. Whether you are looking for a solution that sits in the cloud or on-premises, Kona AI returns lost money to your company's balance sheet and spots high-risk payments to third parties in half the time and half the cost. Conduct better evidence-based risk assessment. Reduce investigations costs. Enable your compliance team to present risk in a timely, data-driven, fact-based manner. Register for your free demo at KonaAI.com or email info at KonaAI.com. This episode, I visit with Julie Myers Wood, the CEO at Guidepost Solutions. We take a deep dive into AI and its uses for data-driven compliance in the compliance profession. Hello, everyone. This is Tom Fox back for another episode, and I'm absolutely thrilled to have back Julie Myers Wood. First of all, Julie, welcome back, and thank you so much for taking the time to visit with me today. Always. So happy to talk with you. Julie, it's been so long since uh, I had you on the pod. I want to reintroduce you to the audience who may not know you. So could you tell us your professional background? Absolutely. I am a lawyer by training and spent the first portion of my career in the government where I served as an assistant U.S. attorney and then worked at a number of other federal agencies, including as assistant secretary of commerce over export enforcement. I was the assistant secretary of Homeland Security over all of immigration and customs enforcement, uh, worked at the White House and at Treasury, trying to hit all the agencies in my tenure, and then left to actually f- form a compliance startup focusing on basic machine learning, the old kind of machine learning, and then was bought out by Guidepost and became the CEO of Guidepost Solutions in 2014. And is that your still your current role? That's still my current role. It's been a great ride. Guidepost is an amazing company. We are a little bit like an octopus. We have our hands in many places and really love helping clients with cutting edge problems like how to, how to deal with AI, right? How to make sure that we're dealing with that in a compliant manner. Before we get to that, could you just give a few words about really the breadth and scope of Guidepost? Absolutely. So Guidepost has about 250 employees around the world. We have four main areas of focus. One is monitoring. We're the monitor for NYCHA, the New York City Housing Authority. We have served as a monitor for many foreign banks. So often when companies get in trouble, governments look to us to help right-size the company and help the company get on a compliant footing. We also have a very strong compliance program where we help companies choose the right kind of software to work on compliance. We help them audit and test them with our big data security team and data analysis team, and then help make sure that there are no cyber threats or vulnerabilities on our compliance side. Investigations, we do investigations all over the world, making sure that companies can find out if there is a wrongdoer or a leak or an internal problem. Helping them solve those problems is really a core competency of ours based on all our former FBI agents, DEA agents, and others. And then we have a security team that does security design work, including assisting in the development and engineering on data centers, as well as school security. So today we're actually going to focus on the intersection of compliance and AI. So I wanted to start with maybe a general question of what do you see as the five key considerations or perhaps the key considerations, a compliance function, a CO, a compliance professional needs to keep in mind when building out a compliance program in conjunction with AI. 
I'll tell you, generative AI is coming at us with light speed, right? And so there's so many things that's important for a compliance professional to think about. I think the first key thing is really take a high level perspective to step back and think of all the ways that AI can affect your company. First, it can be, what is the company using internally? What tools is the company using internally to help its operations or its capacity? Know about those tools. Next, what's the company selling? Is the company selling tools that incorporate deep learning, generative AI, or other sorts of machine learning? And how is the company using that? Third, what's the compliance part of the team doing? What compliance tools are being used? Uh, Fourth, and taking a high level perspective, you have to think about what are these individuals? Who's freelancing at your company (laughs) trying to reduce their work using GPT or something else without telling you and maybe exposing some of the code? And finally, how are criminals using generative AI to get into your work? So that's, that's take a high level perspective and just understand all the various ways that AI can affect you. The next thing I think it's important to think about is, do you know what all these tools are that the company's using? And really get an inventory of tools. And uh, that's sometimes really hard to do, particularly if you're using a mix of homegrown tools, as well as tools that are available for sale on the open market. But the compliance team has to understand what are the tools that each part of the company is using, because only then can you fully understand the privacy or other regulatory risks that may be involved. Before you move on from that one, let me stick with that one. And I say that because my wife recently changed jobs and she's been tasked with that. It's Uh, not with generative AI or chat GPT. It's all tools. Yes. And so I wanted to ask you, if that's just a good business practice to understand the tools you have, who has access to them and who can sunset to them to who can sunset them. So could you just say a word about why that's just a good business practice? It absolutely is a critical business practice. And I will tell you, we've worked with companies from startups to the Fortune 5 that don't have a handle on this because it's so easy for different parts of the business to start using their own tools. But if compliance doesn't understand that, you have a risk not only with potential issues related to generative AI, but you could have other risks related to export compliance or other kind of problems that you have, or you could be paying for multiple tools in different parts of the company and not having the right kind of cost efficiencies by thinking through things the right way. I think it's really important to have an inventory of tools It's a tough discipline and you have to do it. You can't do it once and then be done with it. You have to do it multiple times, but it really will help the company think through what is it that we're paying for? What is it that we're generating internally? And what's the value that we're getting from each of these tools? And sometimes you'll see that you're paying for a tool that you never use, right? So you can get rid of that tool or you're paying for multiple tools across the company and you could have different kinds of data going into those tools and you'd be much better off by centralizing it and centralizing the data and better understanding what's going on. So I, I don't envy your wife because I think that's a, it's a really tough, <laughs> it's a tough job to do, but it's an important one to have an inventory of tools and it's an ongoing task. There's job security in that role. Once for my sins, I was assigned as a lawyer to a procurement function ah. of Fortune 100. And at that company, anyone could buy software if procurement approved it. And as the lawyer, I looked at the contract. And so that, that was my role. But how do you balance the dynamic between trying to give employees the tools they need to do their job with the rigor that you have suggested is really a mandatory business practice about knowing the tools you have? I think it really comes from the top first in terms of what the vision is for either centralizing data and understanding the data flow across the company or whether there's more allowed to be more innovation because the company needs, frankly, to take a few risks in terms of going out with tools. I think you have to think about for homegrown tools, I think it's critically important to think about, do you have the right kinds of compliance controls, including privacy and other regulatory controls when you create the homegrown tool? We've seen many times, particularly with financial institutions that have gotten in deep trouble with these homegrown tools (laughs) where they think their algorithm is great, but it wasn't fully tested or fully vetted. And there's a problem with the homegrown tools. The other thing we see is 
I would say the spin of those who are selling tools. <laughs> you really have to be careful, right? You do not want to be the beta test unless you know you are the beta test for a particular software platform. And often when they're selling you, they're not going to tell you, hey, we have one, only one other customer and they're very small. They're nothing like you. They're going to be really laying it on thick. And you have to think about the rigor, what would happen if something goes wrong? What would happen if they don't have the right kind of controls? And frankly, you had to get all your data back. So I think that balancing act is tough. It does come from the senior vision, but you have to keep on moving through that throughout the process. Let me take a step back to your first point of the high-level perspective. Does this start literally at the board level? Should compliance take the lead on this, or should a different function or group of functionaries within a corporation begin this process? I think we are being hit at so many from so many directions that every part of the business should look at it for themselves. Of course, you want the board to provide a strategic level on how you're going to use AI and what they're going to do, but they're not in the weeds, right, in terms of even how operations run or how compliance runs. So I think operations has to think about what are we going to use, what are we going to do. Compliance also has to think about that. They can't be siloed out, though. They've got to be a part of those discussions. you got to have compliance involved with the board discussions, involved with the operations discussions, and then thinking on their own. At many companies, they're developing an AI working group or an AI team that's thinking through it on a strategic level. I think that makes sense. You want to make sure that they don't just spin off into theory (laughs) and actually do the hard work that's necessary. But it's good to bring everyone together because I think everyone has to have a seat at the table in this very dynamic changing world. 20 years ago, when I was in the corporate world in a software company, we as lawyers tried to protect code and were continually counseling our customers, the employees, not to use open source code. Because if it was open source, then we couldn't protect our intellectual property and someone could rightfully use it in the next iteration of our product. Is iterative AI or chat GPT a similar problem just on a grander scale or is it a different type of problem in terms of protection of intellectual property? I think it's both, right? It's a similar problem. And we saw that with some coders that tried to test out their code, right? And from Hewlett Packard, it got in trouble when that code was then made publicly available. So definitely there is a copycat or mimic function, but there's also the ability just to scrape for generative AI and maybe not chat GPT, but other large language models to scrape and learn from your data in ways that you don't want to take your books from some pirated source and then be using those books and have them out there and talk about them and and learn from them. So I, I do think it's really important, and I think that's the next point we're getting to, is to have clear policies about what you can do and what you can't do and how you have to be constantly aware of employees that may try to shave a few hours off their job and use a tool that is gathering the data and scraping the data and going to be using it for the benefit of others and not for your company. Many years ago in a different life, I did trade secret litigation. And in the great state of Texas, you could protect a trade secret internally by keeping it secured or within a small group of people who knew it. And to me, chat GPT just destroys that component of having a trade secret. Are you seeing instances or are you at least counseling people not to put information in, but then I'm then picking up on your last point. What if an employee doesn't even know that's protected information and they use that in chat GPT? Is that an, that's beyond policies and procedures. Is that an education component on those policies and procedures? Absolutely. There's a critical education component that people need to understand that it seems like it's a simple fix, but there may be disastrous consequences for them personally, if the company finds out, and also for the company. I think what we're going to find is as they're more targeted, generative AI platforms, there are things that will be safe, right? It's safe for a company to invest in. Obviously, Microsoft's made the big investment. Others are making big investments. So there will be safe platforms, but you can't just go out on the web and assume if you download something, it's a safe platform. First of all, it could be uh, a hack <laughs> or something worse. It could be it could be malware that, that could affect you and not even the real thing. We're seeing that a lot. 
or it could be the real thing. It could be chat GPT, but it could be taking your information and scraping it. We saw this recently with Zoom, right? Where Zoom announced that they were changing their terms and conditions and said they were going to be able to use everything discussed in Zoom uh, for their own learning and their own work. They then retreated from that. What, what terms and services are under the radar that we're not paying attention to, right? What are you allowing in the public version of a grammar fixing tool that might come back to haunt you? Those are the things that employees need to know and think about. Just as they think about phishing emails, they need to think about where am I providing my data? Am I leaving my office unlocked by typing this in on an open source platform? You have really scared me. Uh, I realized the danger, but I didn't realize the solution involves almost a complete retraining of your employee base, or at least a supplemental training is, am I hearing you right? Or is it just calm down, Tom? It's really not the conspiracy you think it is. What's hard is that it's a supplemental training, but you also, you want employees that are excited about the potential of generative AI to transform their business, to transform their business function. So you want people to think about exploring things and think about trying things, but they have to do it in a safe environment. And so they have to know rules of the road. And that's what companies you know, have to teach. Here are the rules of the road here. Here's the kind of sandbox that we can give you. Here are the kind of applications that are safe. And we want you to play and explore because guess what? Marketing or customer service, you may be able to, to reduce your, your FTEs or increase your efficiency significantly if you have this AI co-pilot, but we don't want you doing it in a way that's going to harm the company. So it's retraining, but you also want people that have that curiosity and excitement. If you had no one trying to use any of these generative AI tools, I would say you should worry about your company because your company is not full of curious people that are excited about how the world is changing, right? So it's a real, it's a real challenge, I think, for leadership to do this right. And I will say it's a real challenge for companies that are mid-sized or smaller. PwC announced they're going to invest a billion dollars in AI back in April. Billion dollars just in the next three years. Now, part of that was to retrain, re-educate. Part of it was to develop their own proprietary platforms. And part of it was for internal use. Now, what if you're, what if you're a company that makes a million dollars a year or $10 million a year? Is generative AI and these changes, are they going to affect you? Yes. Do you have tons of money to invest? No. So how do you do this in a thoughtful way? I think that's the challenge. And it's a challenge for the Fortune 5 and the, those who've only made five bucks. <laughs> have you seen any uses yet for AI in compliance that lead you or, or you have thought, uh, this is an interesting approach or is, we all know what the 10 hallmarks are. We all know what the sentencing guidelines say about an effective compliance program. And it's really more execution in compliance. I think we're seeing more effective use of data on some of these compliance tools. That's exciting. I think the challenge over the last five to 10 years had been the amount of data that's coming in across companies and how do you use it effectively, right? So this huge swaths of data all across a firm, and you're not really able to bring it all together. And now with AI, we're seeing better ways to bring it all together and make sense of it. And so I think for compliance professionals, that's very exciting because you can start to look at trends and patterns in a way that is, is amazing. And it's not simple automation. It's moving things forward for predictive analytics. So I think it's very exciting, but I think we're on the edge. And so as companies try to decide what tools will we use, right? There are going to be some winners and some losers. I don't know about you, but I got a Betamax for Christmas one year <laughs> instead of a VHS, right? So my, my father always picked the wrong technology device. And how do we avoid picking the Betamax? Because as a small company like Guidepost, we're not going to create a tool. We're going to use tools, right? So you want to use the right tools. And on compliance, there's a lot of those, but there are going to be a lot of Betamaxes out there with apologies to the Betamax creators. And the thing about it was Betamax was better tech and VHS was more for the masses. So which way do you go? I, I, uh, it's, and that, isn't that always the case? The more for the masses makes the money usually. That's why the Model T worked. <laughs> Julie, unfortunately, we're near the end of our time for this episode. But before we leave, I wanted to ask you if our listeners wanted any more information on Guideposts or about Guideposts or the topics we've touched on, what would be the best place or places for them to go? 
so on for guideposts, go to guidepostsolutions.com. You can sign up for our email. We have a number of blogs coming out on AI, but I would encourage everyone that's interested in this topic. If you like subscribe to Apple news or something set AI is a topic that you follow. Try to read a couple things today, each day. I think Axios has a lot of great things on AI every day. They're talking about kind of new changes and it's really important as compliance professionals that you stay on top of it. The world is changing and compliance. You got to be right with them. You've got to be another co-pilot in order for businesses to be safe and secure. Julie, I wanted to thank you again for taking the time to visit with me and let's not wait so long between podcasts next time. Absolutely. Thank you so much.